Hey guys, it's Jason from IMG Filmworks. Welcome to episode one of Building a Budget Beast. This is where I walk you through everything I did to turbocharge my car. So let's talk a little bit about what this series is gonna cover. Basically, it's gonna cover anything turbo related that I did to the car. So, I mean, from my build sheets and parts list to my budget, to things that uh, you know are nice to have versus must haves, uh, you know, things that I tweaked on the, you know, design of how things should work. I'm just going to let you guys in on all of it, everything I did, and uh, hopefully it will be helpful to you. When I started building this a year ago, I wanted to set out to prove that even though a car was higher mileage, even though you were not going to use engine management, you were going to use old school fuel management, and you were going to use budget, you know, and, and budget parts, that you could build a reliable, quick, and really a lot of fun version of your car. But reliability was the key. In fact, one of the reasons it's taken me a year to get to this series is because I wanted a year of real world test data where I actually drove the car every day, boosted at five PSI, and just see what happens. And I'm glad to report that, you know, the car is just as reliable today as it was the day I put the turbo system on. Okay, with that said, let's talk about what the build is and isn't. This build, what I set out to do was make a factory-like car. So it was a car that was quiet when you were around town, still got great gas mileage. I wanted to shoot for over 30 miles to the gallon, which I did achieve. And just in general, the way I feel like the car would run if it came from the factory. What the build wasn't though, was I wasn't trying to bang out a 10 second quarter mile car. You know, there's an inverse relationship between power and reliability, especially when you're talking about the stock internals and, and basically the stock systems on a car. You know, as you increase the power, there's a certain curve that you reach before reliability becomes an issue. So part of my build, again, part of the experiment was to make sure it was reliable. By doing that, I've kept the PSI down around five PSI. Now, could you go up a little bit? Probably. I wouldn't run more than seven PSI on an FMU in the system I have in my car, because then I think you would run into reliability issues. But at five PSI, the car has got loads more power, it's a lot more fun factor, and it's been just super reliable. Okay, so let's get into what is turbocharging. Basically, think of your car as just a big air pump. It sucks air in, it compresses it, it explodes it, causing the crankshaft to turn, transmit it through your drivetrain out to your wheels, and that gives you power, and then it blows out the exhaust through the exhaust pipe. Now, if you've ever heard the moniker suck, push, bang, blow, they're talking about the cycle and the strokes of a motor. And that's basically all it is, is a big air pump. So what a turbocharger does is do nothing more than press a lot more of that air into the cylinders. So what does that do? Well, when you press a lot more air into the cylinders, it effectively makes the cylinders that of a bigger motor. So that's why you get so much power from a turbocharger or a supercharger, because you're effectively increasing the displacement of the engine thereby increasing the fun factor and smile on your face. So then I get asked a lot, is forced induction safe? Because let's talk a minute about when you add a power adder like a supercharger or a turbocharger, really effectively what you're doing is you're force feeding the engine. You're force feeding the engine air and you know, you're compressing it inside the cylinders like we've talked about. So when you force feed a motor, is it safe? Well, that's kind of a loaded question that can't really be answered. It, it has to be looked at on an individual basis. You know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, high mileage engines, you can't, you can't do force induction on a high mileage engine because it causes problems. Well, I beg to differ on that. What causes problems is an unhealthy motor to start with. On my build sheet, the main systems that I looked at was the engine as a whole, the electrical system, the fuel system, and the drivetrain. If any one of those parts inside any one of those systems is weak. Every time you put something like a power adder on, it's just gonna stress that system even that much more and things will break. Think of it more like an older gentleman that might be in poor health and he's getting ready to start a 20 mile marathon. It's probably not the wisest thing to do, but we've all seen guys 
that are much older that can outrun people in their 20s. Why? Because they're in a much healthier state to start with. Same thing with a car. The key is to make sure your car is very healthy to start with, and that means a lot more in terms of safety than whether your car has high mileage or not. So now that we've covered those things, let's go ahead and start talking about the build sheet, because this general health of your systems leads right into what the first thing you should be looking at right before you do the installation. And I broke this down into four areas, the engine, the electrical system, the fuel system, and the drivetrain. All these things need to be in good working order before you add a power adder to it, or you're just asking for trouble. And I think this is where things, you know, get a bad reputation on the internet. You'll have a guy that has no business turbocharging his car because it's, you know, there's something wrong with the motor and, you know, he's got a head gasket leak or he's, he's you know, his he needs a ring job, he's, he's leaking oil profusely in the cylinders, and he goes ahead and slaps a turbocharger on it. He has a catastrophic failure, and then all of a sudden, the kit he bought is a piece of junk that ruined his motor. Well, no, what ruined the motor was not having something in good health before you started, just like my runner example. So you break it down into these four categories. Take a look at the engine. When was the last time you did the tune-up? How is the general overall condition of the engine? Then you move on to the electrical system. You know, when was the last time it was tuned up? How old are the plugs, the wires, since you've done a cap rotor change? How's the ignition coil? Those kind of things. All, anything that's got a, anything that's weak in this system at this point is going to be magnified when you do something like forced induction. Then you take a look at the fuel system. How are the lines on the fuel system? How are your injectors? If you have a problem with a bad spray pattern injector and you've already got a miss on the motor or your fuel pump's really weak, you know, it's just not going to handle the added power and the added, you know, uh, air that's coming into the, the engine. I will say, and to make a special note on the fuel system, you are going to have to change out the fuel pump on the stock system, at least on the Accord two, uh, F23A motor. What you need to go from, the stock pump just cannot handle the pressure. Even if it can handle the flow, it can't handle the pressure. So you're going to need to bump up to the 190 liter per hour Walbro high pressure pump. You could go to the 255 if you want. A lot of people have done that. The problem with the 255 for me was it makes a lot of noise, which kind of takes away from my factory build that I was trying to go for. I wanted it quiet, except when I wanted to open up you know, the exhaust. The other problem you have is the fuel line inside the car is at a fixed diameter. So there's only so much fuel that can flow through there and stay at a constant pressure. There have been reports that when somebody drops a 255 on, it bumps the pressure up. Well, what happens when you bump the pressure up is it's going to backflow the injector slightly. And the more it backflows, the worse your gas mileage gets. And I've seen some, you know, big drops in gas mileage from doing that. The 190 liter per hour high pressure pump seemed to work perfect. So make a note of that on your build sheet when you're looking at your fuel system that you definitely should swap that pump out. And then the last thing I look at is the drivetrain. How's the transmission? If it's an automatic transmission, are you having any problems out of it? You know, is it slipping at all? Is it weak in some area? If it's a manual, how's your clutch? I know before I started my build, the priority number one was changing the clutch out because it was in bad shape. You know, if you have a clutch that won't make it maybe six months normally aspirated, it's gonna go completely very quickly after adding a power adder. And then what you get is more misinformation because somebody's clutch will go and they'll say something like, well, five PSI, a stock clutch can't handle five PSI. When it actually can handle it just fine, it's just their clutch wasn't in good shape. So that pretty much wraps up this episode. I hope you guys are getting an idea of the things you should be thinking about right before you get ready to pull the trigger and buy your kit or source all your parts. In the next episode, we're gonna be looking at the actual parts breakdown and the budget that I spent on each one of these parts, and we're gonna talk about that. And then, uh, you know, we'll get ready for the installation. So please rate, comment, and subscribe. I love it if you would give me a thumbs up if you like the video. And, uh, you know, please subscribe. Hit the subscribe button up there so you don't miss an episode. And I'll see you again right here inside my garage.